I'm down here on the river, going to give it a go, float fishing, two match rods. And the reason I've got two match rods is obviously I can't fly fish with two match rods. A bit of a breeze about today, it could be a bit annoying on the float. But I'm on the river and basically it's to use two homemade floats that guys have made for me. This one was made by Bill Rashmer, who's down in Christchurch. And you can see it's a sort of like an Avon body, bodied. We've done a film on it and I think this is... Um, did he tell me it was seagull quill? I think that he picked up down at Muddy for Key. I got um, top and bottom bands on that there. He's camouflaged it, Bill, as well. So I've put on there, shirt button, three BB. The rod, just so you know, is a Techno Super Tip 13. Wow, I'm so impressed. I've had a lot of fish on it. It's a fast tip, so when you strike, it really flex back fast. Second outfit is, <laughs> total contrast, a one pound rod that I put a tip ring on. This one, uh, five pound line straight through, I'm not messing around, I'm going for, listen, there's days in here that'll probably take your arm off, honestly, and uh, some, a chance of some roach, chance of some roach. This one is Andy Cowdery's one, I think you saw that when I showed it in the tackle shack, and that is uh, a chunkier float, more heavy water, yeah, it might float, it, float work through here, I'm giving it a go as well, and again shirt button, I've got 4BB because Andy's painted on that for it. people like me that are totally thick 4BB, so that's what I've got on there, I don't know where it's going to bring it to there, or down to there, I do, if I'm roach fishing man I need it, so I just barely got anything showing. Um, hooks, right, let me check out what the hook is. It's just not what it is, it's one of those grips, uh, size 12, very thick wire, a very unroach and dace like uh, rig, but you don't know what else is in here. Um, they do get trout in here. I'm out of season, I don't want any trout. You know, they're absolutely mull of everything. Species in here, they've got grayling, they've also got there's, a, you know, there's trout that are around, but I'm not interested in the trout. Um, you can catch those fly fish in here as well, in the season. It's not the season for trout, it's the season for coarse fish because the river season is going to shut in about five weeks, six weeks, uh, over here in the UK that is. And rightly so, it gives it a sort of rest, doesn't it? But I'm after roach and dace. Grayling would be a bonus. If I could get one of each of those species, preferably on these floats, it would be great. Um, I've got some maggots down here. I just got, I went into Chalice's tackle in Andover. I got a pint of red and whites. I'm throw some in, and I? No good taking them home. There was always a good slack over there, which I can never quite reach. Come on. I haven't unfortunately bought my catapult. Ooh. Ooh, right um, a bit of river, everything gets eaten here. I've got a bit of ground bait in there. Just regular ground bait, horse feed and uh, I think it's a little bit of brown I'll put in there, just to help it break up. But I want to really see if I can pick a fish off in that slack. There's trout in here, really get them. They can be suicidal and they can be big. They can be a pain as far as roach and dace fishermen are concerned. It's bait up getting in the water. I've just got about barely four hours. I'm going to go with four whites to start with. I'm going to make sure the float cocks. I hate shotting floats, people. I hate it. Ooh, not bad. I've got to go for three maggots. Just basically to uh, cover the hook. Three white maggots. Very, very slight tinge of colour in the water from a bit of rain. Nothing horrendous. It could be just enough to uh, get those fish moving. Now with grayling, they do bump off the hook quite a bit. So let's get out there. It would surprise me to get a fish first cast, or a bite. So bill float I've got here, I can see straight away is quite light for casting. We'll let it run down. I could probably take another shot like a number one on this. Well, it's a pacey river comes down the inside, the pacey bit. The slack is over there, and generally roach will like the slack. I want to be just barely bumping the bottom. The wind here is sort of off my back. 
thing that is about Bump in the Bottom. Just tripping along the riverbed. Just letting it go right down there. It's almost a sort of what I call back here. You see that down there's a sort of hang point. So the current sweeps around the inside and just holds up there. That's the sort of place I would expect to find um, a roach. First, we've got to get that first all important bite. I could even go a little bit deeper on that float. As far as river conditions go, it's almost it's a bite. I'm right back there. I don't know if you guys can see that back there. There it goes again. Small bite. Could be minnows. Yeah, I'm getting minnow bites back there, I think. It's like there's a sort of tinge of colour in it, but there's not pace, which I find strange. So you can see how long I've been able to keep it down that that back area there. Right. I'm on something anyway. I don't know where I've got the camera in the right position. I don't know where the net is. It's right next to me. It doesn't feel like a day sport grading. If it's a roach, I'm frightened to look at it. It's probably going to be a drought. And he's come off. I'd say that, to be honest, was probably a trout, but at least there's fish there. Not a bad start, and I did in fact put another shot on that, to be honest, another number one. I think it could take 4BB, in fairness. Just going to draw it back into the uh, ground bait line there. And that bite was just as it comes off the corner. Lovely and peaceful today. When I'm on again, guys, I think it's probably probably going to be another trout. That's the difference between the head shakes on this one, and put that camera back up for you. Is that it, uh, it's got some big head shakes on it, might be a bigger fish. Way over the far side at the moment. Get, get pictures of this one. I'll leave that camera down like that, lower. It must be decent fish, he's gone upstream. Well, at least. Uh, Bill Rushmore's float. Oh my god. Bill Rushmore's float seems to be working. This, <laughs> this was an animal fish. Do you know if I get this out, this is going to be fish of the day. I can't grumble if, if I can get it out. Holy cow, it's huge. I don't honestly know whether you're going to get any of this footage. My God, it's monsters. 
What a good job. I went on five pounds straight through. Tell you what guys, it's the size of a small salmon. It might be a small salmon. Very quick with this one, people. Get it straight back. It's a jumbo brown trout. Whack I do. Let's get that straight back. Well, it certainly wasn't the intended quarry, but my god, what a scrap and what a fish. I mean, to balance that, that's equivalent of about a three pound roach. Let's get back out there. Whew, I'm all a quiver. That's strange that because I was talking to uh, one of the tackle dealers and um, not down this way, back in Hampshire. And he was down on, I think it was the itching. Was it the itching or was it the test? No, it was on the test. Doing like a winter match thing like you do, roach, dates, grade and stuff like that. And they were catching or hooking salmon there. And he said, you just hook them gone. So it just goes to show you a bit of patience with the match rod, a little bit slower current and a little bit of luck and you might actually not get bust off. But really, I mean I've come for the Dason Roach, that's what I've come for. Um, Bill Rushmer, thank you for that float mate because that's probably one of the biggest browns I've ever caught on a float that was up there towards doubles I would say. Snagged, snagged in the bottom. Am I going to lose Bill's throat? No. I might have got it all back. I did, so I need to shut it up a little bit. Actually, this float, a bit bent there on the old quill, come down a little bit on it. The, um, the float actually takes sort of shot to about there and it looks okay but from there to there it can be another BB or two it's quite surprising well I can't touch a fish now it's weird just no bites no nothing a few little tiny little dinky bites which I've still got down as minnows and right down the bottom I think I have to move guys because it might be a little bit slow obviously either the roach are at home and not feeding or I'm not able to catch them or they're not there run up there but it's rushes I don't think I can get in there so I think you know what given such a short space of time I've got I think I've got to make a move try and find a little bit pacier water well there is a good looking spot here it comes off what the Americans call a riffle like a rough area of shallow width goes into a sort of ripply area and along there on the inside of a field it could be grayling. It's a bit pacier. I think the only place I can get it down but I might be able to knock some of those rushes down and give me some space with the land in there. I only need enough just so I can get a rod out.
Yeah, if we can get in there now. Yeah, it's more sort of dace and grayling area, and that's what uh, I'm after the big dace. Fish on. What a day, what a day. This is a big grayling. I did say that extra pace would do it, and there we go. What a beaut. Normally they go crazy, I'm gonna try and get his fin up, and there you can see it. Great fish, and that was just by basically looking for that extra pace, and so it proved. Well, I finally got hung in the bottom, and I lost my hook link or hook link my hook. So I'm gonna have a move. I've lost a couple more fish. I guess they're trout, I don't know. I'm gonna move down, there's a second bend down there. The float has expired. That snap there, so I'm gonna to have to change that, but I will now try. I mean, this one's worked, Bill Rushman's float. I'm gonna try Andy's float now, see if we can't get something on that. So maybe this float could be doing with a stronger stem through there. But listen, they caught that giant brown trout. I can't grumble. Let's have a go with the other one. This is a nice bend, I'll show you. Sort of great big wide sweeping bend all the way around. Nice even pace. I'm gonna say more chance of grailing a dace, I'm guessing. And over there, I'm gonna just try and zoom, film, and do it all at the same time. Get in there, there. There's some rubbish. There used to be a tree in there, I think, years ago. But just across the front of that, there might be where it tails up, what I call tails up over there, there might be um, a chance of. Just where it sort of curls and tails off over there, might be a chance, I'd say fish at the back there. But here it looks like that's classic sort of grayling all the way, all the way through there. That all looks sort of pretty well classic grayling territory. And dice, definitely, that's what I'd like. Maybe roach in there, it's more constant. Right, let's have a go with Andy's float. Well, I'm either missing bites or I'm tripping the bottom. And I'm thinking, if it's a slower pace, why not try a piece of bread? Because that is exactly what Mr. Roach likes. Just pinched on the hook. Just like that. See if anybody's at home. What do you think? Try that one again? I think so. <laughs> Won't get the graining, I don't think. I might get a decent roach.
Oh my god, I don't know if it's a roach. There's a lot of twanging going on. What do you get that sort of twanging about? Good sign it's not a roach. Roach is going to fight a lot slower. Let's have a look, see what it is. It could be grading, but on bread, I fear not. A small brownie. More for sort of dace and roach, dace roach grading that type of thing. I think I'll probably go back to the maggots. More chance of the grading. See by fishing on the inside of a curve, this, this goes from here 90 degrees. So if you imagine I'm sort of what, what they call the axis, is it? So it goes like this. So I'm down here on my elbow. I can trot all the way around there without letting the line back almost. I don't have to. I just let it swing around in an arc. So I cover a huge area from here right round to there. And I let sort of minimal line off. It's only just coming up tight there. Now I can let a little bit off and let it sort of go down out of the curve. I'm going to have one more go here and then uh, try back up right tight behind that heap of rubbish. I've got to, a little bit of a slack there. Got to move all the time, roving on rivers. They're very, very, when I say they're touchy, it's in pockets, they're in very small pockets. I think. Well, I've come back to that main bed. We're going to fish it from this side and see if I can hold the float in the uh, slower water a little bit longer and give it a go with uh, Andy's float. At the moment, I've changed floats to another one of Bill's. It takes about 3 BB, I think. So this one seems to be okay and it holds in the water. It's very stable in the water. But it needs fish, is what it needs, to christen it properly. Now I don't think I'll try bread in this one, so I'll probably try uh, a maggots to start with. I think it's Mike had a really big roach here once, years ago. Probably 12, 15 years ago. And you tend to remember it, don't you? It's just, you think there's acres of them here. We'll try it. The old grayling are sort of noticeable by their absence, it's weird. I see one person go past fly fishing, um, I think they have one small grayling up the top there, but other than that, I'll walk right down and they're walking through quickly, so it always tells me that uh, the fish is 
tough. Well, I've come right back up the top end. Nothing on that main bend where I had that uh, big fish. So I'll just fancy in this run and see if I can't put a grayling or a dace out there. Put a good bit of feed in, so hopefully they found it. Well, on at last. And that was on Brit. And the splashes tell you it's not a roach. Indeed, another brownie. The grain is just so hard to find. And there we go. Still a nice fish. Let's get it straight back. guessed it guys. Well that last fish was on uh, Andy's float. I'm going back, I'll put another one of Bill's on here. I know it sort of sits stiffer but this one is a lot stiffer. It's actually got the stick there rather than actually having I think it was a burr quill which uh, sort of collapsed. So that one if I could just hold it dead still you'll see the base is a lot stronger. But I cannot find where these grazing are and the dace and the roach, which I've caught so many of in here before, years ago. Mind you, I haven't been for about four years, so it all changes, doesn't it? We'll give it a go. I think I'll run through with maggots. First run down, people. Could be a dace. Could be. Oh, it's a roach, really. Wow. That was lucky, he fell off the hook, people. Let's clean him up. Not a monster, but a prime even roach. And look, on the back, he's had something like a heron have a go at him, or maybe a cormorant. So the poor old fish in the rivers are really under the cost from everything. Pollution, abstraction, cormorants, otters, a lot. Well, I just need the dace for the whole package. To be fair, I didn't think I'd get a roach in this faster stretch. Well, I've gone for the slack of water, so I thought there might be some dace on the inside of that. And there's little twitchy bites, and there you go. It is Mr. Minnow time, which is what those little bites were. So obviously there's minnows in here as well. That is the problem. And then there's slack of water. They won't want the fast water to be in the slack up. I'll uh, give it a go sort of down there, about one rod length out. It just could be a dace or a roach in there.
Oh yes, it's gone spotty potty. Started feeding and yes, along comes Mr Spotty to spoil the roach fishing show. Finally, a grayling. Seems like I've waited ages for this one. Get one early on in the morning. And there we go, perfect thin up grayling. It's actually a little bit spooky that I've, I've gone back to Bill Rashmus' float, which is a body dave, and because it's got that body, it's holding through the water better, and the stick is way better than that uh, Seagull quill thing. The rigid sticks better, it's holding up better. It's making it sit up rather than skate back, it's sitting up better. And I'm getting fish off the fish now. I've had probably another three or four trout on top of this. Look, look get bites all the way. I'm just feeding little oh, I miss that one talking to you people. I'm trying to feed just very little and often. If I go a bit heavy-handed, um, in comes Mr. Spotty. It's a bit like carp, you know, when you're feeding for roach there. If you feed, feed too heavy. I think we'll get rhino bites over the back. I've probably got about 30 minutes left because I've got to pack up for three. And the wind is also a little bit troublesome. Good little session though. Especially if I watch the float. <laughs> and because being a straight stretch here of 300 yards, it's fairly even paced all the way down. I think the roach might be farther back, I just can't seem to locate exactly where they are. So what I have noticed is that, as well as Bill's float being really good, <laughs> that uh, the white maggots hold up okay when you try and pop them over the eye of the hook, which is how I like to put the first one. The red ones don't, they burst. So they're either older maggots, you know, they've been in the tackle shop longer, or it might be, I've noticed this before with red maggots, they do burst a lot. It might be the stuff they feed them on, you know, to give them the red colour in. Um, that maybe makes the skin a bit softer. Has anybody else noticed red maggots? seem to burst on the hook a little bit more than the uh, white ones. So, the day... Oh, missed that one. The day sign I'm looking for, there is literally about one bend that there might be a day sign. I've got probably at about 15 minutes by the time I walk all the way down river. But I figure it's worth a throw the last 10 minutes. The wind's coming up now, so you probably won't hear anything in the microphone. Now, let's move, guys. So I have one cast in the right place. I'm down on the uh, on the corner, so it's the last chance to leave now. Just throwing a bit of ground bait in, I haven't got much left. Let's see if we can't pick off that uh, elusive giant dace. Well, I did lose what I thought was a dace. Um, uh, next one down, it turns into one of those. hook's jumped out of its jaw and gone into its tail, so I'm fighting it backwards.
Well, time to call it quits. <laughs> That's what I've been getting. So, once you start getting loads of minnows, I think it's time to call it quits and go home. Oh, dropped it. Let you go, bud. So, days didn't come out, but still, great days fishing. Roach, minnows, trout, grayling, but no giant days. We'll see you in the next program. Thanks for watching the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. And of course, we'll do our best to bring you another one. Hit the subscribe button. Both of the channels, TA Fishing, TA Outdoors. And fingers crossed I get a nice mild day like this in the winter again. See you later. I'm absolutely furious. Fury doesn't come into it. Anger, a word of peace. Look at this, I'm livid. This is what's left of my mole removal situation and then this morning look all the way around here no don't laugh don't laugh please i've done all the traps look here's the traps do you know what i should do with the traps beat them on the head with a trap because they won't take it hit them it's got a good deal worse people it's got a very good deal worse the wife said don't go down the bottom of the garden you won't be very pleased I've gone down the bottom of the garden and somewhere I've never seen it before. Yes. Is it to take? Take the take the you know what? Digging up a lawn they've never been to before. Look at the state of this. I've been down here, I've got rid of them down here. Oh no, they want to get close. What the hell's that? That's a big pigeon. They want to get close to here, look. I can imagine they're trying to get nice and warm in a tackle shack. Well, I've had it, I've absolutely had it. If they want trouble, they're going to get it in spades. Bucket and spades. Oh, I'm so livid, it makes my ears flat. I could take off. Right, they think it's funny. They won't now. This one's slightly different colour to the others, and that's a darker one. So, let's find the hole which way it runs. It obviously runs to meet this one. Look at the amount, it's a bucket full of it. Once you get the hole, oh yes, there's the hole. Oh, brilliant. There's one there. Imagine the other one's here. There's the other one, look at that. I'm going to block this side off. If he runs out of there, he's getting both barrels. Well, one barrel anyway. Well, let's see what he thinks of that. The .22, the most powerful antique gun, air rifle, whatever that you could probably blow his head off or I'd be happy to blow his ears off wait a minute I'm oh, sorry mate, what did you say? what did you say? what did you call me? did you hear that? he's laughing you're laughing pal you haven't been laughing in a minute right, I'm off yeah that's right I'm in the mood, I'm in the groove to create havoc with a moles. I've got here. Crackling pearls. I tell you what, when this goes off, it's gonna crackle his pearls for sure. Keep laughing, keep laughing pal. They use this for mining. <laughs> These glasses are so scratched, I don't know which end of the uses it could end badly. To be honest, I can't remember how many bangs there are on this. Was it 11 or 3? In all this excitement, I just clean forgot. You've got to ask yourself, as the punk mole, do you feel lucky? Well, punk, do you? Yeah. Oh. I'm 
love me a smoking molehill. Let's just let him savour the smell of all that explosive. I love the smell of socks in the morning. Because that's the next thing that's going down that molehill. My dirty fishing socks. Hopefully, they've gone for good. Take you into the workshop, show you around a little bit, you see what goes on behind the scenes at Guildford Harley. So, welcome to the workshop. So normally we've got custom bikes as well as servicing, parts, accessories, bits and pieces going on in here. Lots of servicing today, quite a nice rare motorcycle. Uh, this is the El Diablo Mo Rider ST. Um, they only made a handful of these worldwide, which is pretty cool. So there's one there. Um, broken in for uh, engine work at the moment. Um, got one of our custom bikes in progress just over here. Doesn't look like much at the moment. Wow, let's have a look at that. So this one's having an entire swing arm conversion, putting a 280 tyre in there, uh, and then blacking out the entire motor. Uh, bikes at paint, powder coat, polish at the moment, so that'll all go back together in the next couple of months. So what we'll do, if you like, Graham, we'll get you back in, you can have a look at that when it's Absolutely, finished. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Now, just looking at that there, I never knew they came with like a double chain, how stupid yes, am I? this is your primary chain. Why, why not one giant chain? What's, what's the theory um, behind that, you know? Well, I mean, essentially, to get the thickness and the, the, the distribution of um, strain, I think this works really well, while the one giant chain working yeah. on uh, skinny um, loops, as it were. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the primary chain, then obviously we're all belt drive. Every, yeah. Everything's belt driven. That's, what, that's, all, that's the norm now, is it? Yeah, everything's belt driven apart from our adventure motorcycle, which is the Pan America. That bike started out for a good customer of ours called Adam. Um, started out as a 107 cubic inch freewheeler. Freewheeler, we do two kind of factory trikes. So we've got the freewheeler and the uh, um, the uh, Triglide Ultra. The freewheeler, 107 cubic inch, uh, pretty bob stock. Adam's gone to town on that one. We've done an awful lot of work on that bike, mainly with the motor. So it's got a stage four tuned 114 motor in it. So 1868, but it's all hopped up. Um, yeah, that thing will spin straight out of the gate. It is pretty hot, that bike. Really? So hence why it ticks over like two fat people mud wrestling in a well. <laughs> it, 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 the shape of it belies what's underneath the bonnet yeah. sort of thing, doesn't absolutely, it? That, absolutely. You think that's not a fast bike? That that trike is a sleeper. Really? Big time, yeah. I mean, that's one of the things we do at Guildford Custom. You know, we don't just do pretty shiny stuff. And Guildford Harley in general have always been, we've always been into, uh, making stuff go fast you know we don't just do stuff that looks pretty we do stuff that goes and that's you know that's part of the ethos really part of biking us. really isn't it yeah it. we like to make stuff go fast you know suck bang blow <laughs> it's a it's, a, it's a, the option you've got the option haven't you yeah, absolutely. You, can, you can cruise or you can have a little absolutely. squirt now and then yeah, yeah absolutely i mean my father's bike that we built for him that'll just stand in quarter in 13 seconds yeah, yeah. so it's pretty pretty crazy so yeah, back in the workshop. Um, yeah, so the guys are just working away. So Mark's servicing bits and pieces of this lovely old spot here. All the guys have their own tools and stuff like that. Um, you know, they're completely kitted out. I mean, kit themselves out with everything they need. Uh, we have five working bays in the workshop and then two valeting bays at the end. I mean, to be fair, the sixth bay uh, that the Pan America is on at the moment, um, 
in fairness, uh, Simon, who's our part time tech, who works out of that bay on a Friday and a Saturday. Um, so, normally, um, the workshop is full of a mixture of servicing new and used bike prep and custom motorcycles. Pretty much all the custom bikes are out at paint and powder coat and bits and pieces like that, and then they'll start going back together to 7th January. A tire, tire machine, changing tires, balancing, um, you know, grinders and bits and pieces, uh, wash, um, you know, pass washer, uh, component washer in there. Uh, all our benches are sunk into the floor, which makes it easier for the guys to get bikes on and off as Will's doing this here. And this is a parts washer here, yeah? Parts washer, yeah. It's just easier cleaning up bits, you know, oily. What do they use for so uh, degreasing or something for those? Or, you know, if you're uh, washing what, off? What's in there? Marble yeah, it's it's degreasing. Degreasing. It's it's degreasing. It's a degreasing. It's for a degradable work that goes into the environment. Do you have to recycle it or no, no, a, it, it goes down? Yeah, they come straight out the old stuff. Give us some fresh. Gotcha. What would be one of the standard things you do on a service, right? If somebody comes in and want a service, would it be oil change, filter change? What would you change generally? It's a general service for a guy wanting a bike service. We have scheduled services, so we have a list of things on each, like 5k as a specific list, 10k as a specific list, and we do everything on that list. We work on that, yeah. And Davidson recommend. When we, uh, when we prep our bikes as well, so I use bikes to get a full 110 point, 120 point check, uh, yeah. 120 points of the motorcycle. So we check all the safety, you know, if it needs a service. Uh, we'll check things like brake fluids as well. So, um, you know, we do moisture tests on the fluids. So if, if, if they fail or moisture test on brake fluids, we change out all the brake fluids. So when you buy a bike from us, you know exactly what you're getting. Yeah. It's a fully prepared, ready to go motorcycle. Uh, all our new bikes come with two years warranty, which is extendable. And our used bikes come with a one year warranty as a minimum. And that is also extendable. So. We also have an MOT bay, we can do MOTs, um, so this is our MOT bay here, pretty simple, you've got the freight roller, headlight and the guys to go through all the, the bits and pieces to do the testing on that. Uh, Same so as Dave, and, yeah. Dave and Mark are our MOT testers. You catch a man working, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> what sort of pressure do they run in these with the tyres, aren't you? These beamers, it's um, 42 at the front, 44 on the rear. We do uh, not just new and used Harley Davidson, uh, we have a little program with Lynn called Lynn Select. So we will, a lot of part exchanges will just get traded out, uh, but then we get the odd machine like this lovely R1250 RS. Um, it's just a really nice bike, still under BMW manufacturer warranty. Uh, so this is something we'll sell through the Lynn Select program where we select specific motorcycles and we think they're probably worth having to go out ourselves. So um, always have a look at the website because we haven't just got Harley Davidson BMW Triumph. We do have other makes and out here as well. This um, is obviously the ramp, the ramp for the three wheeler, isn't it? Actually, so this yeah? is trike ramp, yeah. So uh, you're actually able to uh, pull this, pull this in and work on, um, you know, two, two wheel motorcycles. But this will also take your uh, trikes as well, which is good. Past apartment just through there. There's our lift that takes you upstairs. Um, parts department is overflowing a little bit because we've got a lot of projects on the go at the moment, so a lot of parts are arriving ready to go on motorcycles over the winter. It, oh, over the winter. This one is uh, MOT, you say, right? So uh, this is the MOT base. This is the MOT base, yeah. This is a Valentine base. So, Valentine base, uh, so, yeah. Valentine, so we're Valentine. Uh, Ultra Limited at the moment, and also this Pan America, which is going out on the weekend. What do you use for cleaning? Just what you know, general cleaning, being different paintwork. So, yeah, you don't want to destroy the paintwork, paint you know. Yeah, no, that's it. So um, yeah, we obviously got like a full wash bay outside. Yeah. Um, so it's all washed down there, and then got loads of different. No, you wouldn't. Really. I'm just asking uh, from an ignorant point of view. You don't jet wash this because you push it in the electric. What do you use as a wash down? You, you can jet wash these. You can jet wash now. it. Yeah, yeah it's all sealed. As long as you're not sort of you Stupid, know, really, ramming yeah. it into the wrong places and everything. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's all jet washed. Yeah. And a special uh, solvent or cleaner for the you know cleaning the, yeah, the metal there's work. Yeah, there's like a cleaning compound yeah. in the uh, in the jet wash there. Yeah, yeah. And then there's different chemicals for each material on the bike. Yes, yeah, because if you had soft here, I'm saying it's not yeah, it's a leather yeah, or material yeah. or vinyl, 
you, like it's, the you've denim, got to watch what you're doing. The denim paint work, things like that. So you can't go polishing like the denim paint because it just ruins, yeah. you know, the, the finish on it. Well, you can't be a bad environment to work in order for people to enjoy no, if you're into not, bikes. No, it's not, animals yeah. like this thing. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So that pretty much. Uh, that's the workshop, workshop yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's um, not a massive amount of interesting stuff going on today in particular. But, battery uh, charging unit over there as yeah, well, yeah? Yeah, that's right, so uh, battery testing and charging unit. And these, these pipes are for sucking all the fumes yeah, out if you're uh, running a your, test? Yeah, that's your um, extractor system. And then just the yard out the back where the cleaning bay is. So, uh, loading and unloading when we come in. Uh, cleaning bay just here. Yeah. Storage in the container. Yeah, oil and then oil disposal that gets picked up and uh, environmentally disposed, disposed of. of. So, yeah, 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 you know, we're all about the environment. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, that's what you call a workshop. Yeah. There we go. So, there you go, people. That's the yeah. inside of the Guildford um, Harley Davidson workshop. Come back and see us in a couple of months' time. We'll show you some really trick stuff going on. It's when the customer and I start going back together. Flowers. They're called gypsy flowers. They're called yeah? gypsy flowers. Um, I taught myself they've been doing it for a couple hundred years. I didn't know that, yeah. Um, they used to make them and sell them door to door. And I taught myself to do it about 50 years ago by watching Rome and he's doing it. Oh, really, yeah? And um, traditionally it's done over the knee. So it's hazel, you say, yeah? Yes, it's hazel. Traditionally they do it over the knee and they pull the stick. Oh, well, I've seen something like that before. Like stripping, that. Yes, yes. But obviously, I've got no wrist and my shoulder's gone, so I made this up. Yeah. Now, this is quite unique because most of these shave horses, the wood comes up to you. But yes, this one yeah, comes yeah, down yeah. to me, yeah. so I'm not stooping right over. Yeah. Um, yeah, I taught, taught myself to do it. It's all made of hazel. And, um, yeah, it's, it's good. Yeah, it's, that's quick. Right. It's, a, it's a hobby. Because my, my son does, he does a bit of bushcraft. Uh, he's got a filming show, but he does. He made a shaving horse, but, and you're right. We we pull. You know, yeah. when you're pee barking, whatever it is yeah. we're doing, you're pulling towards you, like what you got there. But this yeah. is shorter. Draw draw knife and a spoke shave. A couple of the very few tools that you actually pull the blade towards you. Yeah. Everything else goes away. This dates back to 18 something. This. That's an original one there. Yeah, that's an old original one. It's got a make. This is Michael's. It's got the maker's mark on it. Um, what do you sharpen them with? With a stone there's, or something? There's or? another one that's slightly longer, that one. that's I always carry a spare. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't blame it. But, you, but when, you, when you make, you obviously have an edge on them. Yeah. Would you use a stone? I use diamond. I use just a diamond on there. Occasionally in the winter, I'll just go over it with a wet stone. And, um, but that is, that is literally, that is. And that'll stay sharp because you're not going to ding yeah. anything. But really the old are, steel, yeah. if you get the old tool steel, yeah, it's hard, is it? It's a lot better. You buy chisels out of B and Q and everything now, yeah. and they're just made they, of gold, I suppose. They don't they keep, just... they don't keep their edge because it's Chinese it's cheap it's steel. Cheap steel, yeah. But there, I mean, you know, the age of this, this will, this will keep its edge all day long if I sharpen it doing this. It keeps its edge all day. So what's the procedure when you got your hazel like that? Right, I got my hazel like this. I get my stick. Take the bark off because I don't need the bark, and then I basically go all the way around, pulling the pattern down all the way along like that. This is why you need a very sharp tool. It must it's be tricky not not pulling the end off though, isn't it? I should think. Yeah, yeah, it's. I mean, I'm so used to it now. Any blemishes in the, that are in the wood. I actually incorporate, I, I leave it in there, a lot of people cut it out, but but this is a dying craft now. Exactly, yeah. And I've had so many compliments from Romany fraternity. Oh really? That I'm basically, I'm I'm keeping the craft going, because there's there's a knot there, see, I'll actually, I'll work that knot into the next flower, I'll actually cut through and use that on the next flower. I don't like wasting wood. So yeah, fastest I've done one of these is Two minutes and thirty seconds. They're almost like the feather sticks they use to start the fires, isn't that? I'll tell you something. These these are fantastic fire lighters. 
And what about the age of the hazel? You have to use um, fresh stuff so it's got this, a bit of sap in it for this peeling. was cut. This is probably about three days old. This hazel, but I do do it. Um, I do do it with quite well seasoned hazel. I'll show you in a minute the difference in the flowers that you get from from a seasoned hazel. Harder, I mean, harder to pull the drawn. These, uh, draw these, knife, are, these are quite fluffy here. These ones are quite fluffy. But if you look at something like this here, it's really curly. Oh, I see. Th yes, yeah, yeah. This is done. These are done with more seasoned wood, and that's done with a greener wood. So you get a, quite a difference in the actual texture of them. Here you can see the difference between the two guys there. Just here. yeah. So um, yeah, it's a great, great hobby. This is. So I just keep going all the way around like that. I just keep going round. And I can get faster as I go, as I go, because I know I'm not going to slip off the end. Oh, so yeah, you've got the safety of butting up against the others. Yeah. So I can actually speed right up now. Yeah, it's all local, all local North Dorset, um, North Dorset Hazel. Yeah. Taking out the hedges and whatever around the farm where I, well, the farm that I live on next door to. Do they still sort of do the hazel coppice in this area, Somerset Way and Dorset? Yeah, yeah, there is a, there's a Hampshire coppice in group, there's a Dorset coppice in group. But I mean, I, I don't do the coppice in because obviously, I mean, this piece of timber here, I'll get about 10, 12 flowers out of this piece of timber. Yeah, so you don't need a lot then? No, no, I don't need fast the mates. So once I've gone down so far, And of course, you, you just, I'm just working out, you got it, I thought, how's he going to get it off the end, I can see now. There you go. There's the flower, and then you've got a, a stem, I guess, to go on that, yeah, I can see it. Soon as you go, you're, going, you're going deeper than yeah. each stroke you do, you're going to go a little bit deeper. Yeah, bit of technology get... sneaks in now, S sneaks in now, look. Again, a lot of people don't use glue. I, I use glue, and then the same, this is all hazel as well, but smaller stick take the bark off so that the glue sticks pop that in there wow that's interesting there's one for this flower that's brilliant i appreciate that thank you for doing that at least at least you know there's the small ones i'm quite keen to them that small yeah the small ones if you look at those there yeah they're actually hand carved i hand carved those with a pen knife those ones I see it's quite relaxing, though, isn't it? Yeah. Doing it, yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's a great hobby. I love doing it. So. And like, then you can dye them with different dyes and stuff? I, I use a very strong fabric dye for those. Yeah. Because natural dyes you can't get and food colourings. Oh, you think your food colour is not the same? No, no. You can't get such vibrant colours. So, um. Yeah. I'm going to done a few country shows this, so somewhere I haven't seen this, so you're a, you must be yeah. a dying art. I don't but, want to use the yeah. word dying art, I, but it I'm is. I'm getting so, much, so many, I've even sold these to Rogalies. Yeah. yeah but, and, that's like selling stuff to the Eskimos. But I'm getting so many things, they say well done for keeping, you know, the craft piece, alive. I'm actually yeah. keeping a dying craft alive. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So yeah, I'm not going to stop anytime soon anyway. Oh, good, I appreciate that. It's nice so, to see, nice to see. Yeah. So they're oh, very... Sure. Very tall, very thick flowers they are. The flower that lasts forever, provided you don't yeah. tread on it. <laughs> yeah.